Hey, I hope you're doing well. Welcome to this special live coaching session. I'm really excited to dive right into it. And we've got a bunch of really great topics today. First of all, we're gonna be talking about how to win tiebreakers. Number two, how to beat counterpunchers, especially if you are a counterpuncher yourself. We're gonna talk about how to defeat the yips, which maybe is a term you're familiar with or not. It's a tricky one. How do you, or rather, do you have to use modern tennis swings versus more classic or old school ones? And finally, a little bit of tactics and strategy, how to set up points effectively to win. So hope you're excited for this. Let's go ahead and dive right into it. By the way, all of these topics have been uh, left, suggested ahead of time in the comments of social media and the comments of YouTube. So in the future, if you'd like me to discuss one of your topics or a problem area that you happen to have in your game, then please leave it down below. All right, let's jump right into it. How do I win tiebreakers? I've lost the last seven tiebreaks I've played. Sorry, RTB, it sounds super frustrating. I play well all through I play well all through the match and fight often often against higher ranked players to take the the first set to a tiebreak. However, I almost always fall at the last hurdle. Some of them haven't even been close. I've lost 7-0 twice and 7-1 once as well. I don't feel like I play particularly worse. However, something clearly isn't working. Am I just unlucky? Or is there something mentally wrong with the way I play in key moments? All right, so this is really, really common and something that I'm looking forward to jumping into because it's a, it's a big frustration, something I've heard from tennis players a lot. We're gonna get really specific here. So there's two really common mistakes. Mistake number one is players get to that finish line. I love how you say you trip over the, the final hurdle and you say, all right, this is it, man. It's go time. It's time to be a hero. And players swing for huge shots. They try to hit the winning ball, the highlight shot that's gonna like, you know, make Sports Center top 10 later on in the day. And as a result, they beat themselves because most points end with somebody making a mistake. So if all of a sudden you kind of kick the revs all the way up to the rev limiter right at the last moment, the chances of you coming out ahead are really, really low. So here's the second most common mistake. And you'll notice there's, they're kind of at two extremes, at two ends of the spectrum. The second response people have is, oh no, it's, it's a tiebreaker, I better not blow it. And these people take their foot way off the gas pedal and they open the door for their opponent to come in and beat them. And a lot of times players will swing back and forth. They'll try a tiebreaker or two swinging for the fences and beating themselves and then say to themselves, well, that's not working. And then the next time they play a tiebreaker, take their foot way off the gas, play super tentative and careful, and they swing back and forth, and there's no uh, in-between. So here's how you break that cycle. Step number one, ask yourself, what got me here? And the answer ideally should be super simple, like one target, like an individual target on the court or maybe a pattern on the court that has worked up until this point. It might be a weakness of your opponent, it might be a direction of shot, maybe your cross court forehand or your down the line backhand or something like that. Here's the deal, this is critical, I want you to remember this. Something worked over the last hour or so and just distill it down to something very simple. Like if the score is 6-6 in the set at this point, then clearly something works, you know? Like you won a bunch of points somehow, whether it be aiming for a weakness or changing direction or drawing your opponent forwards or approaching the net or serving and volleying or something, something worked. So before you start the tiebreaker, take a deep breath and just ask yourself, ask yourself, what got me here? Something very, very simple, like one shot or a one-two combo, which we're gonna talk about a little bit later in this coaching. Step two, is form a really simple battle plan. So in other words, what you're gonna say to yourself now after kind of taking a little bit of inventory is okay, this worked over the last hour, so I'm gonna double down on whatever that target or pattern is. It should be very simple and very specific. Not something complicated or convoluted or like, oh, now's the time to pull out like this super secret you know, plan that you've been saving in your back pocket. No, no don't fall for any of that. Really successful tennis players are very good at picking out the most obvious, simple thing and just doing it very effectively and very consistently again and again. So that might be picking on their backhand. Uh, maybe your forehand is your big weapon, so maximize your forehand. Run around your backhand as much as possible if that's your strongest, most confident shot. 
or maybe just be steady. And if you're better at the net, like I am, just look for an opportunity to transition forwards and just be steady and solid from the baseline. Step number three, expect them. So everything we've talked about so far has been focused on your side of the court, right? We're, we're looking for what's worked, something very specific, uh, very, very simple. And we're doubling down on that, consciously picking out that game plan. Step three is expect your opponent to pick one of those other two paths. Remember the, the two paths, either being a hero or taking their foot off the gas. So expect one of those two things to happen, maybe not 100%, but they're going to kind of pro they're probably going to kind of waver in one direction or the other. So if they're going to try to be the hero, go ahead and let them try and let them swing for the fences. Statistically speaking, more than likely, they're going to end up beating themselves more than they actually hit winners. If they take their foot off the gas, then be prepared to take advantage of that and actually apply pressure, swing confidently, approach the net, take the opportunities that they give you. And so this is your game plan. Step one, two, and three. Go use it. And finally, just a little bit of statistics here. I want you to remember a couple of things. Federer is actually the most winningest tiebreaker player of all time, ever. And he's won 65% of his tiebreakers. It's like way, way more than your average tennis player. Um, Isner, you would expect, would be super high. And he is. Like 61% historically is very high. He's got a huge serve, and so that kind of helps a lot of times in big tiebreaker. But I just kind of picked this one out too. Karlovic, one of the biggest you know, serves of all time, has only won 50%. Uh, just imagine that. What, what is he, six foot 10 or something? Can hit a 130 mile an hour serve? Coin flip. <laughs> so I understand. If you've lost seven tiebreakers in a row, yeah, something's probably going on here, and you're probably either trying to be a hero or you're taking your foot off the gas. It's probably one or the other. You're going down one of those two paths. But even if you've got great tools in your toolbox, and even if you're a great competitor, don't expect to be like winning eight of them or nine of them out of 10. If it was competitive up until that point in the set, it's probably gonna be about a coin flip. And it's only the best players of all time that are a little bit above a coin flip, AKA 65% with Roger. So hopefully that makes sense. Uh, really good question. Again, quick uh, review. Uh, those most common mistakes are huge. Step one, what got me here? Step two, form a really simple battle plan. Step three, expect them to take path one or path two and be prepared to respond to it appropriately. If you do those things, you're going to be much more successful. I, I guarantee you. All right, great stuff. Next up, we got a, a question from Mehar or Majar. One of those two, sorry, I'm not sure which one it is. This question is, how do I play against backboard counter punchers, not a pusher, it's an important distinction, when I am a counter puncher myself? So let's define that. So pusher means that we're playing against somebody who's purely defensive. They don't really have any weaponry at all. Their weapon is consistency. So they don't have any particular like standout shot that they can use to apply pressure or hit a winner or maybe even necessarily hit a, a passing shot. It's just consistency, consistency, consistency. That is their weapon. Whereas a counter puncher is somebody who can receive pace and redirect it really effectively and hit pressuring shots. They're, a, they're able to hit a winner. They're able to hit a passing shot. When you attack and you send them pace, they can send it back really effectively, just to be really clear on what a, a counter puncher is. So this player is saying, well, I'm a counter puncher, so how do I beat that style of player? Well, there's three options. Let's go over all three. And this is assuming you don't want to play a totally different game style than you normally do, because that, that's an option. But if, if you're just saying, because you're telling me, hey, Ian, I am a counter puncher, I'm assuming you don't magically want to become a servant volleyer or an aggressive baseliner or a, a pusher, you know, a defensive specialist or whatever. So let's just assume that you're going to stay a counter puncher. So if that's the case, here's your three options. Option number one is pray that they have a bad day <laughs> and just keep doing what you always do the way you always do it and just hope that they kind of have an off day. Now, this might happen. Obviously, it's not an ideal game plan, clearly, especially if they're like a half a level above you. 
we want to have something a little bit more special in store for that. So we're kind of throwing out option one and two. Option one is is play a different game style. Option two, hope they have a bad day. Hope is never a good strategy. So let's move on to the other ones. Option number two, or three, depending on how you're counting right now, is be more steady than they are. So the kind of the core of a counterpuncher is steadiness. It's just that they also have the ability to come away with a big shot as well. So option one is to be more steady than they are. And that means know what you're most comfortable with, what patterns you can repeat again and again and again, and try to influence your points in that direction. So here's what, here's what I mean by that. Let me set this up really quickly. Sorry, this was, uh, I was talking about doubles earlier today. So let's just say that you know that you're, and maybe especially in particular against this specific opponent, you know that, man, if I get into a forehand to forehand rally, if you're a, a right-handed player and you know the deuce side pattern is just going to favor you because you just, you're just you just a backboard on that side. Plus, if you can get them to give you kind of a short sitter in the middle of the court, then you also have the ability, let's say, change direction and attack, which we're going to talk about in a second. Well, in that case, any pattern that's kind of floating towards like the middle of the court or, or any pattern that is establishing itself on the backhand side. What I mean by be more steady than they are and knowing your core patterns is simply influence the direction of play to bring it back to your core pattern. A lot of times tennis players and especially counter punchers or defensive specialists are kind of a little bit more passive. And it's like their opponent might hit the return of serve here. And counter punchers generally are high IQ players. Defensive specialists are high IQ players. And so they'll keep the ball cross court and just say, all right, here I am. Like, I'm just not going to go anywhere. And I'm going to rally really high percentage and not make, the, not make the error. I'm not going to be the one that makes the mistake. Well, against another counter puncher, if you don't want rallies to last forever, then look for opportunities to change direction. You know, a lot of times I focus on consistent tennis here on Essential Tennis, but knowing when to change direction is equally as important as knowing the percentages and being really, really consistent and steady because most points end with an error. So this would be a scenario, counterpuncher versus counterpuncher, where you do change direction. And instead of keeping everything back where it came from, let's draw an arrow here. So if as the, the ball comes to your backhand side, rather than go back to the high percentage target, say, you know what? This isn't a super stressful situation, so I'm going to consciously put the ball here because I know that my counter puncher opponent is probably going to go to the open court, and fantastic. Now I've established the pattern that I want going in this direction. So you should be looking specifically for opportunities to find your most repeatable pattern and influence the point in that direction. I don't know what it is for you specifically. Obviously, I'm just picking a random example here, but look for opportunities to influence the point in, in the direction that you want things to go. And as you do so, maintain solid margins. This is probably stuff you already know and you're, you're good at because you're a counter puncher. Mentally prepare for maximum patience. You're, you're going to have to, in, in this option here, being more steady than they are, you have to kind of steal yourself mentally and prepare yourself mentally for this is going to be a grind. It's going to take a while, but if I can get the patterns in my favor, then I know I like my chances. So option number three is apply pressure more effectively than them. So what are counter puncher's strengths? Steadiness and then sending back pace. So we, if, that, if that's what you're going to stick with, if you're going to stick with the counter puncher style of play, then we, we got to pick one of those two MOs and do really, really well with one or the other if you're gonna beat another counter puncher. So this is going more towards the pressure side of things. Know your top ways of attacking reliably, the most consistently possible. Lean into those opportunities and pay attention to what causes them during points. So a couple uh, just like random examples of what that might be. Let's say that you don't mind coming to the net. A lot of, a lot of times counter punchers don't mind coming to the net. Like they don't mind transitioning. Look for where on the court, maybe it's deep in their forehand corner, maybe it's short to their backhand, and as they move and kind of stretch and scrape a little bit, they end up kind of coughing up a little bit shorter ball. Look for cause and effect. Look for the patterns that result in an opportunity for you to come forwards and apply pressure. However that 
is most comfortable for you, whether that be pouncing on a short sitter, whether that be approaching the nets and establishing yourself up at the nets, whatever it is for you, look at what sets up those opportunities for you. And that should be kind of your key focus if you take this approach to try to beat the, the counter puncher. So a couple of suggestions. Here's how you can apply pressure. I think I have three different suggestions here. Number one, draw them forward off the baseline. This is one a lot of people don't think of, but against a counter puncher, somebody who makes their living scrambling back and forth and defending really effectively, and then when it really matters, like when you approach and stretch them and come up to the net, that's when they're able to like just all of a sudden hit a clean winner. Super frustrating. So why not draw them away from that comfort zone purposefully, consciously hit the ball low and short to draw them forwards and then test their volleys and test their overheads. This type of player typically is very comfortable and very savvy moving laterally. Well, let's make them move vertically and A, just see if they can do it. So experiment with hitting high and deep and pushing them back. And then on the next shot, hit low and short and slice the ball and draw them forwards. And if they move up to like this point, close to the service line, they hit a ball and then they run back to the baseline again, you've got a huge opportunity to pressure them by actually drawing them forwards towards the net and forcing them to have to hit a bunch of volleys and a bunch of overheads. So that's a huge opportunity against a counter puncher that a lot of players don't even try. Instead, they just try to kind of do the shooting gallery, you know, the, the carnival like shooting gallery game, and they just try to hit winners left and right, left and right, left and right. Well, counterpunchers kind of love doing that. Like that's why they've chosen the style that they have. So try moving them forwards and back and draw them forwards specifically. Make sure you swing confidently in short sitters, especially if you're gonna approach the net. You can't just come in off of any old shot. You've got to kind of make it a special scenario. So really confident, uh, really practice that short sitter to make it super confident so that you know you can, uh, you can convert on it and move in and hit your best shot and then approach after it, but only if it's a quality shot. And so what I mean by that is, if this counter puncher gives you a short ball and you move in and you pick out a target and you just don't hit that target and it floats towards the middle, or maybe you mishit it a bit and it just it's not moving through the court the way you were hoping, and so you haven't hit your target and it doesn't have a lot of pace and it's just kind of ends up being, you know, just kind of a nothing ball, then what I'm saying is go back to the baseline again and reset. I know that takes patience, and I know that can be really frustrating against a really steady player, but it is what it is. Like, you know what you have here. Like, you know who's on the other side of the court. It's your style, too, in this example. So you have to respect that and only come forwards and really pressure if it's a, it's a worthy shot to come in behind. You can't come in against a, off of an okay shot and expect to do well against a really skilled counterpuncher. So lots of practical stuff here. Put it all into practice. I know you'll be much more successful against that type of, of player. All right, coming up, question number three. You guys like my, my invisible can? Check that out. I bet you can guess what flavor, what flavor beverage I'm, I'm drinking based on... <laughs> Based on my can's transparency. All right, question number three. Coming in from David. What do I do if I get the yips on my forehand at the start of a match? David, I know all about this. Now, if, if you're not familiar with the yips, it's, it's terrible. If, if you don't know what the yips is, then maybe skip this. <laughs> because it's probably better that you just don't ever think about it. And you, you just totally remain ignorant, uh, to be honest with you. I'm, probably, I'm gonna kill the viewership here, but uh, if you don't know what the yips is, then stay stay blissfully unaware. So I, I just copied and pasted this from, I don't know if it was Wikipedia or an article of some kind. So here's the definition that this article gave. Involuntary muscle spasms, when you're trying to perform a specific movement. Commonly, the yips are associated with baseball players and golfers. The term yips was coined by Tommy Armour, a professional golf player in the early 1900s. So I've, I totally know about the yips. In fact, it happens to me all the time. I'll talk about that in a second. And it's gotten 
really, it, in the past, it's been aggressive for me. I totally lost my forehand, like totally lost my ability to hit my forehand, which was my like go-to weapon outside of my, my neck game back in high school and in college. So once in high school and once in college, it totally left me. And it started with the yips, like right about the time, like I was getting ready to swing, like it, exactly like the description said, like just a little bit of like a spasm or a twitch and you kind of lose your confidence and your feel for it. And if you're not careful, it can just like spiral out of control. We're gonna talk about how to avoid that. And I, I feel like over the years, I, I've really developed a good system that works really well for me. And so I, I hope it really, it works really well for you as well. So both times in high school and in college, it took for like four or six weeks of just like pushing, like slicing forehands and like going to the court by myself and dropping and swinging and hitting and trying to like find my feeling for my forehand again. It was, it was terrible. So I understand this. Now, here's maybe what's surprising is I also got the, the yips just last week working with a student, just feeding balls very commonly. So here's the thing. I'm not a normal, well, I'm obviously not normal. I'm not a normal tennis coach, like where I get in my car every morning, I drive to a tennis club and then I go teach all day and I get back in my car in the evening and I drive home again. I only go onto a tennis court to teach a student a couple times per month. We're gonna talk about why this kind of ties in. And so frequently when I'm feeding tennis balls to a student, something that I've literally done millions of times, I have no question in my mind, I've fed millions of balls over my 20 years I've been full-time teaching. I've been teaching 30 years now. I've been around tennis 30 years, starting points, starting rallies, working with students professionally for over 20 years, millions of times. But it's not a big deal for me anymore because with experience, I've learned several things. And so let's, let's talk about this. So four kind of keys here. Uh, this is some of these kind of conceptual and some of them a little bit more practical. Number one, accept that tennis is hard. This might sound weird to start with, but when you think about it, like taking a little you know, fuzzy object and a uh, paddle or racket and trying to send the, the little orb to the other side exactly where you want it to go, doing that the same way again and again is, is like mind-blowingly complicated, but we don't usually stop and think about how much goes into it, the, the fine-tuned muscle control, building habits, training and practicing, and being able to hit the ball in the middle of the strings consistently and angle the strings where we want the ball to go, the chances of the ball going somewhere other than where, where we want is astronomically higher than the ball going where we want it to go. And so like just overall coordinating your entire body and sending the ball where you want it to go off of your strings is really, really difficult. So that's number one. Number two, except because of number one, that there's always going to be good days and bad days. Some, you know this. Like if you've been playing tennis for more than a week, then you know that some days your timing's going to feel fantastic. And it kind of does feel like you can put the ball wherever you want it to go. That happens maybe a couple times per year, right? Where everything's just like, wow, this is awesome. Like I just am able to do everything I want to do. Then there's days where nothing <laughs> happens the way you want it to go, right? And it's like, Every shot you try just feels totally clunky and awkward and uncoordinated. It's like, what am I doing out here? Like, I, do I, have I even played tennis before? I don't know. That's also like, going to happen a couple times per year. And then everything else is going to be somewhere in between. And so there's going to be sometimes big swings, big ups and big downs uh, as you play tennis day after day after day. Okay, so that's number two. Number three, accept that your training is valuable and it never goes away. Now, this might seem like it kind of contradicts these two things, but it doesn't. When you've hit a million feeds like I have, it's always there. And frankly, like when I'm feeling it, I'm super precise with my feed. Uh, if you look at our YouTube channel, like I challenged uh, Kevin and Megan, and I think Kirby as well, to horse, uh, feed horse a couple times. We made a video out of it, and I've rarely lost a game of feed horse where you like, you call your shot and you feed it, you know, whatever, try to hit something or like this number of bounces and, and then it, it hits off the water jug or, you know, something like that. Once you've done something again and again and again and again, that training is still there. Like it stays with you. Now stuff on the surface, like having a bad day and the fact that tennis is just hard 
can kind of create static. It can kind of get in the way and kind of wedge itself in between what you're trying to do on any given day and the training that is in there. Like you've, you've laid the neurological pathways and they don't just erase, you know, overnight. But sometimes we can kind of spook ourselves into thinking that that does happen and that's what can cause us to go into a really negative spiral and the yips really start to kind of take over. So accept these three things. Tennis is hard. There will be good and bad days. There's going to be big ups and downs. But despite those things, our training is always there. Like it, it, it doesn't just go away just because we're having a bad day. And so this leads us to key number four. Don't take bad feeling swings seriously. And so when you first feel that first swing, that's like, ah, like, man, I felt really awkward or uncomfortable. You basically, you've got two choices. Choice number one is take it seriously. And I, I've been here. Like I've, done, I've done this. I've taken this path many times in the past. And here's what, here's what you're saying to yourself when you take it seriously. At, or immediately after, you know, a, a really uh, janky feeling swing. Oh, like, oh no, that felt terrible. What if it keeps getting worse? This is awful. Like, it's like your first forehand of the warm up of a match, right? And it just feels totally clunky and, and, and like riding a bike with square wheels. If your first thought is, this is terrible. Oh no, like I'm getting the yips. And, you're, and it's all this like, what if, what if, what if? Uh, man, if I don't find it, then how am I gonna beat this? You know, this is a good player. And I really need my forehand today. And if you start going down that negative spiral, then it'll take, it will, it'll take over. If psychologically, you can't just like pump the brakes and just take a deep breath and relax, then it's going to be a downward spiral. I've experienced that many times. Here's the second path. Here's the second way that you can choose to take, not taking it seriously. So here's your internal dialogue when you take that path. Immediately after that weird feeling swing, huh, well, that was weird, that felt strange, but okay, let's just relax and, and swing again. That's an option. And remember, going back to this, accept that your training is valuable and it doesn't go away, it's still there. And so if you just choose to not take that bad feeling seriously, you can essentially just be like, okay, whatever, and reset. And on the, the next swing, relax, just be calm, and just let the racket and your body move as freely and smoothly as possible. And when you take that path, I can't guarantee to you, you're always going to have a great day and you like the, it's going to instantly like poof and make your, your problems like all disappear. That's not going to happen. Well, may, maybe it will, but it's not, I can't guarantee it's always going to happen. But at the very least, you're not going to accelerate your, you know, downward spiral into yips hell, <laughs> which is a very real possibility. So here's, here's the deal. I'm not on the court a lot. And so in turn, like I teach, like I said, a couple times per month, most of what I do is, is content and doing digital coaching. So frankly, I feel this feeling pretty routinely now. Like it's kind of normal for me to feel the, the, the beginnings of, of the yips. And I'm not going to tell you it's like easy, but I keep getting better and better at just not caring and just not taking it seriously and just kind of, well, okay, I'm just going to go to the next one and relax and do the best that I can. And I can tell you that over the years, it's totally changed my ability to handle this and deal with it. Whereas in the past, I would go down a really negative downward spiral. So take that second path and I'm very confident you're gonna have more success. You're gonna have less experiences of the yips just totally destroying your confidence and destroying your enjoyment of the game. Hopefully that makes sense. I'm grab a drink real quick. So, Today's broadcast is brought to you by EssentialTennisAcademy.com. I've been publishing content for over 14 years, and Academy is the place where I provide stepping stones and success plans and paths for every single part of the game, whatever you want to develop. Forehand power, serve spin, placement on your volleys, double strategy, single strategy, your fitness, 
your mental game. There's a module or several modules and training sections full of videos for every single part of your game. This video is not sponsored. Instead, it's brought to you by Academy. And you can go check it out for free, actually. If you go to EssentialTennisAcademy.com right now, you can get seven days of access to the entire members area, 56 modules on improving every part of your game, 66 student films. Uh, every time I work with a student for a day or two full days, uh, my production team edits it all down really nice and, and really professionally. And we put those inside of Academy. So you can learn from me working with other 3-5 doubles players or 4-5 singles players or whatever your level is and whatever you're interested in. There's also a drills library full of 100 drills for singles players and doubles players. So you can make your training sessions really fun and interesting and you can mix things up and keep improving. And it's less than the price of Netflix. It's just $9.95 per month. And I do weekly live training sessions where I answer questions and I do video analysis for students. It's the best value out there. If, if you'd like personal guidance from me, then make sure to go to EssentialTennisAcademy.com. Okay, question number four. <clears throat> Matt wrote in and said, why do I, as a middle-aged 3-5 player, need to dump my Jimmy Connors forehand and switch to modern Federer or next-gen Kyrgios forehand to advance my game? I love this question, Matt. I think it's excellent. I'm really looking forward to talking about this. So a couple of case studies here. First of all, let me introduce you to Fred McNair. Uh, Fred was a member at the last club that I taught at full-time before I transitioned to focus on essential tennis full-time, so over a decade ago. He was uh, the number one ranked doubles player in the world in 1976. Uh, that year, he won the French Open. And at Congressional Country Club in, in D.C., where I was working, he was one of the best players at the, at the club. Even though at the time, I believe he was in his 60s. Yeah, he was in his 60s. He, I mean, he still had it. I mean, especially like around the net. I mean, you could see the way he moved. By the way, here's his, uh, his Wikipedia page. Um, so you can see uh, he actually won four singles titles and made it pretty deep a couple times in uh, Grand Slam singles. But doubles was really his specialty. He won the French Open, made it to the um, quarterfinals, to the semifinals in Wimbledon, uh, U.S. Open. So anyway, very old school, you know, classic old school style of player. But because his game, you know, had elevated to a certain level, even though his, you know, back in the day, back in the 70s was his heyday, he could hit with anybody at the club, even players who had very modern, you know, strokes, were very like advanced, you know, junior players or, or adult players. And I got to play with him a, a handful of times. It was just a pleasure playing with him. Because you could just see the precision, uh, the way he moved, his balance, his composure, the cleanness that he hit the ball. It was just really, really fun. Uh, fun to watch and really fun to play with him and, and hit with him. So that's just, just a personal like, experience of mine. And I've had other ones too. Like, I got to play a uh, set of doubles with Martina Navratilova actually back in the day. So like, I've, I've seen in, like, it very much up close in, in person uh, case studies of kind of classic old school, but world class, you know, players and exactly how impressive they can be. Here's a second case study. Somebody who's more current, like maybe you're saying to yourself, oh, sure, well, that was back, you know, in the 70s and the 60s. Have you ever heard of Leander Pays? Easily, one of my favorite spectator moments in tennis was watching Leander Pays play doubles. I, I don't think, and I've watched all of them, I've watched all the greatest current, you know, players, uh, very up close, like front row, like right behind the baseline. I've been very, very fortunate to be able to get media passes and stuff like that. Federer, Nadal, Djokovic, uh, Serena, Sharapova, like uh, I've seen all of them very up close and personal. One of the most impressive things I've ever seen in person was being front row and watching Leander Pays play doubles. Mind-blowing quickness and anticipation and speed and just like straight up intimidation, like his movement and just, man, the way he was able to stick volleys, incredible. So let me go to uh, Leander Pay's uh, 
Wikipedia really quick. He had a 30-year professional career that just ended last year. He started in 1991, finished in 2021. During that time, he won 18 Grand Slams. And just a legend of the game. And so he, he just retired. And now I, I want to show you this really quickly. Uh, I, I shot this footage. I, I got to shoot a practice session of his. I just want you to watch really quick how he moves and watch his technique. And tell me, tell me if you think this looks like modern tennis or like something from, uh, from another era. And, you know, just watching a couple shots, it's pretty, pretty easy to tell. This is, this is not even close to what people would call, you know, modern tennis. Obviously, fan, I mean, fan, like I said, one of the most impressive things I've ever seen was watching Leander Pays play doubles uh, up close. So obviously, v incredible athlete and extremely talented. And he's, he has all the tools to be, be a world-class doubles player. And that's kind of the last thing I'll um, kind of address here is, is some of you might be saying to yourselves, oh, well, sure, and well, you're talking about doubles. Well, no, what we're really talking about here, let me go to our, our notes here. What we're really talking about here, what, what are we trying to accomplish? This was uh, Matt. What's Matt trying to accomplish? And all, all my, myself, myself included, all of us, what are we trying to accomplish collectively? Are we trying to beat Kyrgios? Well, you're, probably, you're not watching. You're not watching right now if you're, try, if you're literally trying to beat Kyrgios. But let's just say for the sake of discussion, you know, for, for the sake of conversation, your goal is to beat Kyrgios. Well, you better adopt a modern game and change everything because there's something to it, you know, right? Like if you're trying to be an elite, 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 world-class player, there's a reason why they use, you know, that style of moving their body, swinging the racket. There is, there is advantage to it. But if your goal is simply to win, maybe at your level, your club championship, you know, be just a respected player in your local area, it's absolutely not necessary to adopt modern swings at all. If it's possible for Leander Pays to have a 30-year career with one foot in more traditional tennis and the other foot in modern tennis, singles, doubles, I don't care. You, you win 18 grand slams. You're, you're a world-class you know, professional athlete, incredibly skilled, incredibly talented, with very classic old-school strokes. And so there's all kinds of examples of, player, of players, world-class players, using more classic type of technique. And so if it's good enough for them, it's good enough for us. And so just to be clear, there's a reason why the current pros do use modern techniques. Like They're necessary if you want to be a world-class singles player and you want to be like in the top 10 in the world then it's necessary like you've got to adapt and adopt more of the you know you're going to have to change your grip over more than leander who's like maybe a strong you know continental grip like that's you're not going to make the top 10 in the world but that's not what we're talking about here for the rest of us very high quality execution of old school technique is absolutely enough so Here's the bottom line for me. If you feel stuck and or you're just kind of curious, like what's this, you know, what's all the fuss about this whole like modern swing thing and, and you just kind of like experimenting, then go ahead and, and give it a try. Go ahead and jump in and, and just give it a shot. And just to be clear, like it's not going to be some silver bullet. Like it's not going to be a cure for all your problems. It's not going to instantly like fix everything and you're instantly going to be a 5-0 level player. Like it just doesn't work that way. You're going to have to train it it's going to take commitment. It's going to take a lot of repetition. But if you enjoy working on improving yourself and improving your tennis, then you might really have a lot of fun doing it and learning something new and something more, more modern. But if you're totally satisfied and progressing the way you want and you're reaching your goals the way that, it is, the way that you're currently swinging the racket, then there's no need to change the fundamental way that you approach the game. That doesn't mean there's not things you can improve. There are, there are apps, all of us have our own rough edges, but whether it's more of a classic style or a modern style, there's always gonna be those rough edges. So like switching over to modern tennis isn't gonna just fix all of your athletic DNA. It's not gonna fix all the flaws in the way you move your feet, the way you move your body, the way you move your racket. You're still gonna have obstacles to overcome. 
There's, there's no quick fix to any of the, the problems that any of us have in our tennis game. Uh, it's really all about what you enjoy the most, but either way, there's a path to reach the level that you're looking to reach. It's just a matter of, if you're gonna stick with classic you know, style, it's a matter of being very precise, very athletic, moving your body you know, really well biomechanically, very efficiently, strongly, using the kinetic chain. It's all the same stuff. It's just a different style of doing it. So hopefully that makes sense. It gives you a little bit of clarity. You absolutely don't have to. You need to kind of listen to what feels best to you and what's most authentic to you. All right, quick drink, and then we'll get to our last uh, topic for today, which is a really good uh, tactical one. Looking forward to, uh, to addressing this one. Big thank you to everybody who's watching live today. Hopefully you've been enjoying these, uh, these streams. And again, if, you, if you'd like me, and by the way, um, don't put it in the live chat because that disappears. Um, if you have a topic or a question or like you're, you're frustrated and stuck on something and you'd like me to, to help you out, uh, don't put it in the live chat, put it in the comments section. It might not show up while the stream is going. So sorry if that's the case, like, uh, but I think there's a way to kind of X out of the, the chat and then go to the, the actual comments section. And so that's where you want to, otherwise I'm not going to, I'm not going to see it later. So you might have to come back later and put it, put your question in the comments. And I can't guarantee I'm, I'm gonna get to it, but uh, I'm gonna get to as many as I can. All right, question five. <clears throat> From Jordan, what are the most effective one-two punch strategies for singles and doubles, and how do you set them up with points earlier in the match? So interesting way of phrasing that, Jordan. We're, we're gonna come back to that. So there's, uh, I got three steps for you here. And excellent question. You should be thinking not just in terms of like strength or weakness, but in terms of pattern, how can I set things up to give me the advantage and hopefully, ideally, take the advantage away from my opponent at the very same time? So step one is to be a really good Sherlock Holmes, to be a good observer and use deductive reasoning and just ask, like, what is it about what's happening on the other side of the net that looks a little rough around the edges or like, a, like it might be a little bit difficult to repeat again and again? So what we're looking for is two or three biggest flaws or weaknesses. So specific things to look for. Look for movement. How smooth or how efficient does it look? Or how, how rough and, and kind of jerky and, and janky does it look? Shout out to Kevin Garlington for uh, the word janky. Look for balance and positioning. A lot of times players put themselves in the wrong spot on the court and or when trying to recover, this obviously ties in closely with movement, they just don't do it very gracefully or efficiently. And so they'll leave gaps of exposed court available for you. Look for technical fluidity, like how smoothly do they move their body on their forehand side versus their backhand side, on their drive or their topspin shot versus their slice shot. And so you should be just eventually, intuitively kind of going down through this checklist in your mind. These are just some examples. If all of us collectively kind of made a master list of things to look for, I mean, we could easily come up with 100, 200, 300 things to look for that are potential red flags. I'm, I'm just trying to give you some food for thought here. And then finally, look for shot consistency. Like what is the result and how repeatable is that result? There's going to be a shot, no matter who you're playing, even if they're like way better than you, <clears throat> there's going to be a shot that is a little bit more volatile and there's probably going to be a shot or two where it's like, it's just the same. It's the same tempo, the same speed, the same height, the same depth, the same spin, like again and again and again and again. Okay, like make note of that. But on the other end of the spectrum, rather than just be impressed and be like, holy crap, like their, their backhand slice is just a wall. Like they just never miss it. Well, what is it about their strokes that is, again, is a little rough around the edges and is more volatile? Where even if they're trying to hit you the ball, there's like a range of where the ball goes. Some are a little higher, some are a little lower, some are a little wider, some are a little deeper, some are a little bit shorter. You should be making mental notes of these things during the warm up, and definitely during the first two, three, like four games is a critical period for you to make like 
red flags should be going up, lights should be uh, blinking, like sight, whatever, bells should be going off in your head. When you start seeing the volatility, the jerkiness, the rough around the edges, the lack of smoothness, these are the things that you should be looking for. And that this is how we're gonna start to create these, these patterns. So step two is to create two or three simple deadly patterns. And emphasis here is on simple. Good tennis is not about complexity. Good tennis is, is not about setting up a chain reaction of like five different shots in a row where first I'm gonna push them deep and then, then I'm gonna get them short and then I'm gonna hit heavy topspin and then slice. And then after that, then I'm, then I'm gonna drop shot and then I'm gonna lob and that's gonna open the court and then I'm gonna hit the winner. Like, no, that's, that's ridiculous. Even elite high level players, they're only thinking in batches of like groups, or like groupings of like two shots, maybe three, but that's pretty extreme. A lot of times we only need one. We only need a single shot. It doesn't even have to be a pattern. Shout out to Will, ha uh, Will Hamilton at fuzzyyellowballs.com. He's the first person I heard use the phrase battering ram. Meaning, let's go to the court. Meaning, if you see early on that your opponent's forehand is super solid, and that's the shot where it's like, man, this is just the same. It's just a carbon copy again and again and again. But if you change direction because you're like, man, this is, I'm never going to win this way going to the forehand. Let's try the backhand. And on the backhand side, it's like, it's just, there's, it's a little bit rough. Like it doesn't even have to be where like you hit them a backhand and they just immediately chunk it into the net. But it's like ah, kind of high and loopy. And then the next one, they kind of drive it barely over the net. Uh, and then they kind of hit one wide. And then they hit a couple okay ones. And then they hit one deep. That's the first shot that you should be targeting. And the battering ram simply means let's focus all of our attention and all of our intention on hitting everything we can within reason over to that side of the court. This is like the most simple, basic way that we can be mindful of our opponents and then set up a pattern of play. And in this case, the simplest pattern ever, just target this side and just repeat it again and again and again. And this works for doubles too, by the way. Uh, in a double scenario, same kind of deal. If somebody's backhand is obviously the weaker one, Let's go ahead and, and set up doubles. And so it, it might mean that right off the bat, you're saying to yourself, well, their backhand is weak, it's unreliable, so I'm gonna hit a kick serve out to the backhand, and then if they get it back, we're just gonna keep the pressure on until we get such a weak shot that we can put it away someplace else, through the middle or at the feet of the net player or, or something like that. So keep it simple is really the first most important rule here. And the battering ram approach is the simplest way. I mean, this is what Nadal does, right? He takes his forehand, hits it to his opponent's backhand, and then just repeats again and again and again until there's exposed court somewhere else, and then he goes somewhere else. Very, very simple. And it just needs to be repeatable in order for it to be effective. So the, the second way of thinking about this, setting up these patterns, is to stretch and then expose. So let's start with the doubles example first. So let's say that this is a left-handed player over on the other side of the, the net, and they love their forehand. So they're setting up like over here to try to hit as many forehands as possible, and they're doing that because they're trying to hide the backhand. Well, rather than target here, which is usually tends to be everybody's first thought is, oh, okay, well, I see what you're doing there. You don't like your backhand, so I'm gonna try to make you hit backhands. And so you keep targeting that T again and again and again. And every time you target the T, the lefty moves over a little more and a little more and a little more, and he just keeps hitting more and more and more forehands. This is where we need a one-two punch. And this is where you can stretch them and then expose what they don't wanna hit. So rather than just being totally myopic and just thinking, oh, I can only focus on the backhand, let's actually on purpose hit it as far over to the shot they want. Because if we do that, that will stretch them in the opposite direction and that exposes the next target, which hopefully is gonna be their weakness. The chances if, if, if we pull them all the way off in this position, the chances of them hitting another forehand on the next shot are really, really low. Even if we struggle with the next ball, 
that are likely gonna have to hit a backhand on the next shot. And so it's the same thing in singles. You see professional players do this a lot. And especially, I would say, the, like the last couple years, a pattern that's been really popular because most players are righty is they'll target on the deuce side, hit a really big swinging slice serve because as a right-handed player, the slice curves off to the left. And so even though the forehand tends to be the favorite shot of the opponent, what professional players are doing a ton is targeting the out wide corner, getting a little bit of stretch on their opponent on the return of serve, and then whatever comes back next, they're thinking in terms of one-two punch and targeting the backhand side next. And so, yes, we're hitting a ball to their strength first, but it's consciously to set up what's gonna come second. It's to set up the second shot. And so this is just one specific you know, example. It might not always work out for you, depending on your opponent. This is, this is where Sherlock Holmes comes into play. You have to be paying close attention and taking specific notes on each specific opponent. They're not always gonna be right-handed. They're not always gonna prefer their forehand. It's not always gonna be singles or doubles. And so you have to be intelligent enough as a competitor to notice the correct things up front and then start to set up these patterns. So this is just a, a very simple, straightforward, probably recognizable pattern that you've seen re just recently, you know, watching tennis on TV. And that's an example of the stretch and expose. So the core tactic there is hit it to the shot they want, hopefully at least in a little bit of a challenging way, to expose the shot they don't want. And you can do that in both singles and doubles. And here's the third key here. This is maybe the most important one. Going back to what I said a moment ago, this is not about being complicated. This is not about being sneaky. This is not about being tricky. This is about finding a pattern or two that does work and then just going to the well until it's dry. Meaning, as long as there's water there, as long as you're still milking some points from that target or that pattern, you just hammer it just again and again and again and again until one of two things happens. Either they make a tactical adjustment in where they're standing or where they're aiming, or they somehow they make an adjustment tactically that neutralizes your plan, or they make a technical adjustment. So if at the beginning of the match, their backhand is just a train wreck, and they, they're, like, they're hitting the net again and again and again, every time you, you get the ball a little bit high to their backhand, they just dump it right into the net. Well, it might be that at 5-0 in the first set, they all of a sudden kind of figure it out, and they're like, oh, that's right, like I gotta swing low to high. And then they start missing the net. And all of a sudden they kind of get into a groove. And then all of a sudden it's like, oh man, like they're actually looking really good now on their backhand side. Then you shift, then you shift the focus over to the second most uh, vulnerable pattern or shot or whatever it is. Remember all the different things we talked about earlier. Go to the second most vulnerable thing that you picked out and then go to that one and just milk that one and go to the well until that well is dry. It's gonna be very rare for us normal players, you know, I'm not talking about professional players who have just loads of talent and tons of tools in their toolbox. For the rest of us kind of normal players, all we need is one of those patterns. Maybe on a tough day, two. If they figure out how to neutralize your first one, maybe you might need two. For most of us on most days, you're not gonna to have to go down your checklist to number seven or eight or nine. Like it's not gonna go that deep. Uh, like the person you're playing just doesn't have that many looks. They don't have that many ways of reinventing themselves and figuring out how to problem solve all their different weaknesses. You're gonna eventually get them. So it's just a matter of being very focused and very diligent about very simply picking on whatever that rough spot is again and again and again. That's how you're gonna be most successful in the game of tennis. But hopefully that makes sense. Good question. And I'm gonna keep trying to do these uh, once per week. Uh, if, if you enjoyed the stream, do me a favor and click the like button. And if you'd like me to answer your question, don't leave it in the live chat, but leave it in the comments. Uh, I can't guarantee that I'm, I'm gonna be able to answer it. 
Uh, but if you do want to guarantee that like, I will help you every single week, then go to EssentialTennisAcademy.com. Every week I do a live Q&A session exclusively like inside the private members area. And I answer every question that's submitted every week by students. So I basically become your personal coach. And you can send me videos. You can ask questions about anything related to tennis tactics, strategy, the mental game, fitness, technique. I'll just be here to help you every single week. So hopefully you've enjoyed these. Thanks so much for watching. Uh, thanks for your support of Essential Tennis. I'll be back again with one of these really soon. And uh, if you'd like me to answer your question, make sure to leave it in the comments section down below. Thanks a lot. Enjoy the rest of your day. And keep up the great work on your game.